Good morning. The Lord be with you. I'm Gary Nagy. I'm the pastor that's been invited, and it's been my honor to accept that invitation to lead you in the worship of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, sent by the Father in agreement with the Spirit to bring us good news. And the good news today we're going to hear also involves peace. But it's a strange sort of peace because along with that peace, Jesus says, sadly, as a result of that, there will be war, there will be division, there will be fire. But we know God is on our side, and he who has come into the world is greater than he who is in the world. We are in, I've been asked to invite you to the uh, rally day potluck at 9.30 this morning for our Sunday school kickoff. Let's now join together with heart and voice and sing, I want to walk as a child of the light. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness.
Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your presence and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia.
Lord be with you. Let us pray. Merciful Lord, cleanse and defend your church by the sacrifice of Christ. United with him in holy baptism, give us grace to receive with thanksgiving the fruits of his redeeming work and daily follow in his way. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Testament reading is from the book of Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you, filling you with vain hopes. They speak visions of their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. They say continually to those who despise the word of the Lord, it shall be well with you. And to everyone who stubbornly follows his own heart, they say, no disaster shall come upon you. For who among them has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see and to hear his word, or who has paid attention to his word and listened? Behold, the storm of the Lord, wrath has gone forth, a whirling tempest, it will burst upon the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has executed and accomplished the intents of his heart. In the latter days, you will understand it clearly. I did not send the prophets, yet they ran. I did not speak to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, then they would have proclaimed my words to my people, and they would have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their deeds. Am I a God at hand, declares the Lord, and not a God far off? Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord? Have I heard what the prophets have said, who prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long shall there be lies in the heart of the prophets, who prophesy lies, and who prophesy the deceit of their own heart, who think to make my people forget my name by their dreams that they tell one another, even as their fathers forgot my name for Baal? Let the prophet who has a dream tell the dream, let him who has my word speak my word faithfully. What has straw in common with wheat, declares the Lord? Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces? This is the word of the Lord. Be the epistle reading is from the letter to Hebrews. <laughs> By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, To Isaac shall your, pro shall, you shall your offering be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. By faith Isaac invoked ble future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith Jacob, when dying, was each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the, son's Fer be refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch him. By faith the people crossed the Red Sea as if on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. 
By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had been given, because she had given them a friendly welcome to the spies. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept relief, so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us they should not be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. This is the word of the Lord. According to St. Luke, the twelfth chapter. Jesus said, I came to cast fire on the earth, and would that it were already kindled. I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. Do you think that I have come to give peace? peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, in one house, there will be five divided, three against two, and two against three. They will be divided, father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you say at once, a shower is coming. And so it happened. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, there will be a scorching heat. And it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? This is the gospel of the Lord.
mercy and peace belong to you. From God our Father, because of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our theme verse this morning is from Luke chapter 12, 51. Jesus said, Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. So far the words of our Lord. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, love the sinner, hate the sin. Although somewhat flawed, that gives somewhat of a picture of how God thinks of people. He loves the whole world, wants everybody to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth as it is in Jesus Christ. Yet he hates sin. He hates it so much that he knew that punishment must follow sinfulness. But he also knew that because the punishment was so deep, so needful, so overarching, that no human could pay for his or her own sin. So his plan before creation, agreed upon by the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, was to send Jesus into the world to replace us under the curse of the law. And that curse involved death to pay for sin. Love the sinner, hate the sin. But in our day and age, the world has looked at that differently. Love the sinner, embrace the sin. There are, on social media sites, plenty of occasions when somebody would hold up a blank piece of paper and say, look what Jesus says about this, and you can fill in the blank, abortion, same-sex marriage any kind of social ill that the church has always declared to be a sin is now not a sin because Jesus never said anything about it, did he? Well, that myth is easily dismissed simply by saying, Jesus never said anything about spousal abuse, so that's okay? Of course not. The other thing that the world doesn't know that we do is that all scripture is given by inspiration of God as the Holy Spirit led him along in prophecy, the writers. And so we realize that Jesus didn't say everything in his three years here, but he did write everything that went from creation to the book of Revelation talking about the future. So in there, there are words of condemnation. For instance, today, we've heard from Jeremiah that false prophets are false. We've heard Jesus himself say that what he brings to this world will cause division. Not because he wants division, but because people won't believe that it takes something called repentance to receive the forgiveness of sins that God has earned for us in Christ so that we could be completely at one with God in Christ. The other way we can dismiss those kinds of things is to say, well, the Bible was written by Jesus, as I said. The entire Old Testament was proven to be written by God when Jesus quotes from every major section of that Bible. He doesn't quote from the Apocrypha, the intertestamental period from the time Malachi finished writing until John the Baptist came. So that's why we don't include it in our scriptures. When it comes to the New Testament, well, that's a little bit different story, but we still have good evidence that this is what Jesus wanted us to know. Now, I recognize that even Martin Luther would have said that he didn't like James because it was a straw epistle thinking that James was talking too much about good works. But James' emphasis was a faith that believes in Jesus does good things. 
He didn't like the book of Revelation either. But we can see that the way the church has figured this out is, if the books talk about Jesus in the same way and harmonize all of the things and are able to answer all of the critics that come up with causes for doubt, for instance, why on the day of resurrection does Jesus tell a woman to stop holding on to him and tells yet another to hold him, to touch him? Well, different circumstances. Those can be explained away. So everything that the church talks about when it considers what we consider our New Testament talks about the Jesus that wants to be known in that way. Now, there are some crazy ideas that come after the first century, so we dismiss those automatically. And any book that says that, well, when Jesus was a little boy and some people, some children were making fun of him, he turned them all into stone statues. Well, we can pretty well figure out that that is not something authentic. So we have a way of saying the whole counsel of God is contained in what we consider the Word of God, the Bible. So, the reason we have to set this up in this way is because we don't embrace sin. We hate sin as much as Jesus and the Father and the Spirit do. As a matter of fact, just before Jesus spoke the words that we've heard this morning, he tells us that the servant doing what he has told the servant to do is blessed. And he's telling us that because you and I are going to face, because we say there's sin, we say there's punishment, we say there's a judgment day, and the world dismisses that, just like the false prophets of Jeremiah's time saying, peace, peace, but there is no peace, gets us prepared for the trouble that we're going to face. The trouble we're going to face is because of our faith. We read in the Bible that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. So there will be trouble. Luke reminds us, as he quotes Jesus, that we must pick up our cross daily, which means there's going to be burdens to carry. There's going to be health issues, family issues, wealth issues, all kinds of problems that we're going to face. And while these things occur naturally, Satan has a vested interest in us looking at those things only naturally and saying, oh, well, maybe God isn't there, or maybe God doesn't love me, or maybe God's punishing me. But none of those things are true. Because Jesus says, I'm preparing you because I have come to bring fire. Fire. His word is fire. His word of forgiveness is fire. The fire that cleanses us from all sin. The fire he faced in facing hell on the cross when he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So that we would know that through his sacrifice and the forgiveness of our sins, God would never, ever forsake us. So the first fire he's really referring to is the hell fire that has been extinguished by his baptism going through that fire and then giving us a water baptism that puts out the fire with his word. When he said, it is finished on the cross, paid in full. Debt owed, nothing. But the people who don't embrace that have to dismiss their sinfulness, and some claim it doesn't exist. But it does. And it's only through Jesus and his sacrifice that we receive God's friendship, his fellowship, his love, and his care for us. Now, there's also a fire he's giving to us, as I mentioned. It's the fire of tribulation. Peter reminds us that these tests that we have are tests to prove that our faith is genuine. That it's not something we have made up, 
rather something God has given us. Now Jesus does say, peace I give you. John quotes that. Peace I leave with you. It's not the kind of peace that the world gives. That's what I give to you. And so let not your hearts be troubled. Don't be afraid. Jesus' peace is different than world peace. Because world peace simply means there's a stopping of the fighting. People still hate each other. People wish they could kill each other. There's animosity everywhere. That's worldly peace. But Jesus says the warfare is over. Isaiah was told to tell the people, comfort, comfort my people. Tell them the warfare is over with God. That God is no longer at war with us. He's at peace because Jesus went to battle for us one-on-one -on -one against the devil of the world and our own sinful flesh. The warfare is over. Because Christ went to war and conquered us, conquered for us. And disarming, as the Bible says, those who would accuse us through the bloody cross. There he paid the debt we owed and could not pay. He paid the debt he did not owe. But this peace that he brings, brings division with it. Now, part of that is good news. We're divided from our sin. Jesus says, as far as the east is from the west, as he wrote the Old Testament psalm, as far as the east is from the west, so far have I removed you from your sin. Because east and west never meet. North and south do once you pass a pole. So he wants us to know that's how far it is. Now Jesus says this peace that he brings is more important than family relationships. Because there are going to be some people, even in our own family, let alone society, who don't believe this. And he wants us to take our stand with him. I have a daughter who's 42, lives in Idaho. When my dad died a number of years ago and she came for the funeral, I had a chance to talk with her about faith and God. She grew up in the Lutheran church. She went to Lutheran school. And I said, you know, we haven't had a chance to talk about what you think is the plan for eternal life. And she said, well, if you do good things, you'll get there. Well, I know that's wrong. We're justified by grace through faith in Christ's sacrifice apart from the works of the law. So I put a pebble, so to speak, in her shoe. Because that's all a Christian has to do is put a pebble to make them think. So I said, okay, so if there's a world religion that authorizes and sanctions and encourages that religious group of people to come and kill me because I'm not of that group, they're doing good. Well, she said, I don't know. And that's the pebble. Because that's what she needed to think about. Now, I love my daughter to death. But if it comes to me choosing my daughter and saying, yeah, everybody gets to heaven because that's what she thinks, just by doing good things, no, I must stand firm with Christ. He is the answer, the only way, the truth, and the life. Now, this division also divides us from false prophets, as we've heard. Thus saith the Lord, but he never said anything like that. There is no peace if somebody surrenders the guilt and say, ah, it's, it's, it's not guilty anymore. Peace comes with God, knowing Christ brings the peace by his cross and the blood from that cross. Now we're divided, knowing the peace, by knowing the truth that an end is coming. There is an accounting. 
Paul says we must give an account to God. A week or two ago in a Bible class, some people were very upset by that because they were wondering what they have accounting, what they have to give an accounting for. But remember, our sins are all forgiven. And God says, I remember your sins no more. So what's the accounting? What's this judgment day thing about? Well, it has to do with a public display, uh, a public presentation of why you're going to heaven because your sins are forgiven and why another person isn't going to heaven because they didn't embrace Christ, didn't believe him as the Lord and Savior of the world. But when I looked up the word accounting that Paul uses in Romans, we must give an accounting to God, he really simply is using the word, word. We must give a word to God, as if he were to ask, why should I let you in? Now, Paul doesn't describe the word, but we can certainly think about a word we can use. Jesus, nail prints, forgiveness, all of those things that he has done for us. Because it's not the greatness of our faith, it's the greatness of our God. A faith smaller than a mustard seed, pretty tiny little thing, is still a saving faith. Now this faith God has given us prepares us to face the world and the divisions, but also to embrace the divisions that God has with us and sin, bringing the peace, of course, that Jesus has. So now, like Abraham, we trust God's promises. He was about ready to sacrifice his son Isaac. They're walking up the hill. Isaac a very smart young man, about 17 years old, says, Dad, we have everything except the sacrifice. Where is the sacrifice? Not knowing yet that he was the sacrifice. And Abraham said, God will provide. Now, Abraham's mm, 75, 85, 90 years old. Isaac is 17. I think as they got closer to the altar, and he put Isaac on the altar, Isaac could have said, you're a crazy old man. You're sacrificing me? But no, he went literally and peacefully. A picture of Christ, of course. And then God, of course, provides the alternate for the sacrifice, just as Jesus has provided as the alternate for our paying for our sin. But the thing about it is, he trusted God. God had said all along, this son is going to carry on everything that needs to be carried on until this son, many generations later, will come through him and pay for the sins of the world. As a matter of fact, when they got to where they were going to do the sacrifice, just before they went up the hill, Abram tells the servants, you stay here. The boy and I will return to you after we've finished. The boy and I will return to you. Abram believed in the resurrection, trusting in God's promises. We heard about Isaac and Joseph knowing the future. We know what the future is. We, like Jacob, want to bless our children, not with simply worldly wealth, but with a knowledge of knowing that eternal life is theirs as a free gift, as it is for the whole world through Jesus Christ. Keep the faith. And Jacob did this leaning on his staff. An old man bent over. Not wondering why has God allowed him to live so long. Not wondering why has God done this to me. But knowing that God was with him. And even in his trouble, he was able to say, God is good all the time. Like Moses and his parents, considering the reproach of Christ greater than the wealth of the treasure of Egypt, we obey God, not man. And so for somebody who says Jesus never said that, he may not have uttered those words in his three years of ministry, but thus saith the Lord, assuredly he said it elsewhere. And then, the author of Hebrews also says that Moses trusted the Passover. Kind of a strange thing. It was going to be the 10th plague, the last plague, the greatest plague, killing man and beast, 
only the firstborn. Plagues aren't that indiscriminate. Just talk to anybody that got COVID. It hits anybody, anytime, anywhere. This plague hits only the firstborn man and beast of the Egyptians. And God says, here's how I want you to avoid the plague. Sacrifice an animal, a lamb, and take its blood and smear it on the lintels and the top of the door and then place the basin on, on the bottom by the floor. And when the destroyer comes, he will see the blood and pass over you. You know, sometimes the world and the worldly view that sometimes can come to us makes us wonder if God has us do different things. You know, like when they were in the wilderness and the serpents came and, and bit them and they died and they told Moses to get rid of the serpents and God says, well, fashion a bronze servant and stick it up in the middle of the road, stick it up in the middle of the camp, and if you look after having been bitten at that bronze serpent, you'll live. Any Boy Scout can tell you that's not how you handle a snake bite. But you look at that bronze snake and you live. And Jesus says, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man is lifted up on the cross to pay for sin. How do we have eternal life? How are we assured that our sins are forgiven and God accepts us? We look at the cross. And Passover becomes Holy Communion. And we receive the very body and blood given and shed by Jesus on that cross every time we receive it. And God passes, us, passes over us with eternal death. The list went on and on and on. But Hebrews ends this reading with, now, we're surrounded by a lot of witnesses here. Let's lay aside every weight and sin that clings closely and run with endurance the race set before us. Looking to Jesus, who is the founder and perfecter of our faith, and for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despised its shame, and now is seated at the right hand of God the Father. We consider that too. The troubles that we face, the fire that comes, the tribulation that is ours because we believe in Jesus, is something that we endure and we despise it and we see and lay hold of the sight of the mansion in heaven that God has prepared for us because of Christ. He who endured from sinners such hostility against himself don't grow weary or faint-hearted. The world has no other choice than to dismiss the nature of sin. We have a supernatural choice given to us by God, the only answer to sin, the forgiveness of sin, and the forgiveness of sin only and through Jesus Christ. So this is how Paul would end a conversation like this. If God is for us, who can be against us? Now, the way the original language reads, it gives the answer in the question. Like a child wanting a cookie just before dinner, and mom says, you don't want to eat that cookie right now, do you? And the kid says, eh, I guess not. So, who can be against us? Nobody. He didn't spare his own son. Gave him up for all of us. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Nobody. It's God who makes us right, justified. Who can condemn? Nobody. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, was raised, who's at the right hand of God, who is indeed still praying for us now. So what shall divide us from the love of Christ? Nothing. Tribulation, distress, persecution, Famine, nakedness, danger, sword? No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm sure, I'm persuaded, I'm convinced my faith in spite of what the world tells me and in spite of what I see with my own eyes, I am convinced that death, life, 
angel, ruler, present things, future things, powers, height, depth, anything else will be able to divide us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. And now the peace of God, and that passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Amen. We confess our common faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory, judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ and for all people according to their needs. We pray in peace to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the spirit of Jeremiah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and Moses, and the others, that in the days of division our hearts would be strengthened to confess, in word and deed, the glory of God's name, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the power of the Holy Spirit to overshadow the servants of God, they may build up the church of God on the eternal foundation of his holy word, and we ask that you would send to us a pastor we would call to serve here at Ascension, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. 
for parents that they may bring up their children to resist temptation and to endure all for the sake of Christ, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for our nation and for all those in authority that our Lord God Almighty would behold them in his mercy and replenish them by his grace, that all who receive the sword would bear it according to his word, always inclining to his will and walking in his way, that we might lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the sick, especially Steve and Connie Dean, Chloe Hunt, Alan Padgey, Jim Sims, Barry Willits, Lynn Mass, Kent Parker, Nancy Lawson, Dan Jones, Jerry Heap, Carol McGuire, and those we name before you in our hearts. that God would grant healing to their bodies, strength to the weak, endurance to bear up under trial, patience to await his deliverance, at peace at the last, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For hearts that prize our baptism and the communion of the saints above all other relations in this world, even as we pray and strive for the salvation of those we know and love, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. In thanksgiving for the saints who have gone before us, that we who share with them the feast of heaven would also follow their way through death to eternal life, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Hear us, most merciful Father, in these our humble requests, which we offer unto you in the name and for the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Lift up your hearts. We give to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you have created and sent your one and only Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and in the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood 
as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers. Deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. have and are going to pray for the forgiveness of sins. And so we recall our Lord's plan for forgiveness when we hear that our Lord Jesus Christ on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said take eat this is my body which is given for you this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. O Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, in giving us your body and blood to eat and to drink, you lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for the final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that, of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Thank you.